the job market, so hire me first. But then if you're looking for someone else, maybe I guess you can look at him. Uh, so let me turn this on. So hi, everyone. My name is Alex. I'm from the University of Washington. And on behalf of all my um, co-authors, I'd like to present drunk user interfaces. So we'll start off with a question. We'll see how this goes. How many of you have ever sent a text that you later regretted because you were under the influence of alcohol? Oh, I see some walking hands. OK. Um, OK, let's let, no, keep them up. Let, let's go really crazy here. How many people have done that in the past 48 hours because of Kai? OK. Oh, I see a couple. OK, so some people could sympathize with me recently. Great. Awesome. So um, this is not my text. But um, for those of you who have ever gone through that experience, you probably know that it's really nice to have a friend with you to be able to grab that phone out of your hand and say, hey, you know what? You probably shouldn't be doing that. You should be making better decisions. But of course, we can't always have our friends with us when we're drinking. Uh, so there are all terms that people have designed embedded in the app. So for example, this one on the left is just a very scary message with big text that says, you shouldn't be doing this right now. And maybe that's a mechanism enough to get someone to stop doing the texting. But an interesting app that I'm showing on the right is one that actually gives a person a math problem. If you're able to solve the math problem, then you're allowed to send your text. If you're not, then you're locked out of your phone in this drunk mode. And if you think about this, this is really interesting because it's presenting a, a challenge of the person's cognitive and you can even imagine also doing motor abilities uh, in order to basically prove to a phone that they're not drunk. But the problem with this is that it's very binary. First of all, it's either you're drunk or you're not drunk. And it hasn't really been evaluated um, rigorously. It's kind of this toy novelty app that people will download and occasionally it will work. So we were curious about how far can we push the envelope on this? Could we actually, as HCI researchers, evaluate one of these apps and maybe even get a continuous measurement of blood alcohol? So that was the goal of our project. So we were interested in developing a smartphone app that measures both human performance and other data through embedded sensors in order to get a continuous measurement of blood alcohol measurement. Now, given the number of hands in the room, um, drunk texting may not be the most applicable um, application to everyone in the world, and that's OK. Um, we have many other applications that can come to mind. We list them in the paper. Um, I'm not saying that it's as easy as just drop an app and everything would magically work. So for example, um, in this first um, case, you can imagine that there are more cars that you can now lock and unlock with your smartphone. You could come to an agreement with your insurance company and you can say, hey, we'll give you a $100 rebate if every time at 10 p.m. you're going to get into your car from a bar. You have to do this challenge, this kind of math problem, if you will. Um, there's lots of legal implications, lots of ethical um, issues that need to be untangled. But uh, what I want to get across is that there's many more applications than just drunk texting. But that's the fun thing to talk about at Kai. So uh, trying to measure blood alcohol level or levels of drunkenness through smartphones is not a new problem. Uh, there are people that looked at gait analysis. So going under the assumption that as people will get more alcohol in their system, their gait becomes funny. Um, the issue with that, at least for some of the applications we had in mind, is that it requires quite a bit of physical effort, particularly for someone who's sober, who doesn't want to have to walk 10 steps from their car and 10 steps back just to prove that they're sober. There's also a commercial app that is, used to be available, it's no longer available, called Breathalyze, that's looking at a phenomenon known as nystagmus, which is the phenomenon of horizontal gaze flickering rather than being very steady. Uh, one of the issues we found with this is that it requires an extra person to hold the camera, and you need to be in a pretty well-lit room, which in the case of many bars that I've been to, especially recently, they're not all very well lit. Uh, one of the projects that's most similar to ours, and I highly recommend reading this paper, it's a really cool paper, is by Bay et al. And what they did was that they convinced people to give a lot of sensor data um, and have it continuous mo continuously monitored. So everything from usage of SMS to location, uh, screen status, whether it's on and off, they collected all of this data, and then through self-report and experience sampling, they classified episodes into one of three categories. So non-drinking, drinking, and heavy drinking. And the, one of the, there's many uh, interesting characteristics about this study. So one of it being that it was conducted in the wild. So people were out do, going to bars, drinking as much as they wanted to. It was continuous monitoring. So it wasn't like they were coming into a lab and doing a one-time experiment. Uh, the one um, not, uh, not so great thing, if you will, is that they, they did classification on experience sampling. And there's been some research that shows that experience sampling is useful, and there's um, other cases where people might over or underestimate the amount of alcohol they're drinking. Uh, the study that I'm going to be presenting today is almost the exact opposite of this. We did a super controlled study in a lab. We're doing single time measuring, though we would argue that many of the apps that we're looking at could be done implicitly rather than explicitly. 
And we're looking at seeing if we can get a complete regression, so a continuous measurement of blood alcohol level rather than discrete categories. So we came up with the awesome acronym, Drunk User Interface. Um, you can imagine why it could be interesting. Uh, so what I want to uh, define a drunk user interface as is a smartphone-based task that challenges a person's motor coordination and or cognition. And we're doing that by measuring the side effects of alcohol through um, high-level performance metrics and low-level sensor data. Contrary, what I don't want to define a drunk user interface as is a means of measuring uh, alcohol inebriation or concentration directly. We are not doing a biological measure. We're measuring the side effects. So if you want to get into the nitty gritty of can you use this to arrest someone or send them to jail, we can't under current thinkings in the law. And we can't really necessarily distinguish between if someone's tired versus someone being drunk because often those symptoms can be conflated you can imagine that if someone's as tired as appearing drunk, if you're looking at the drunk driving example, you wouldn't want someone behind the wheel. So again, depends on the application you're talking about, but I want to be very clear that we're measuring side effects that could be other things. So there's many different drunk user interface that we came up with and many that we actually didn't implement in our final study, um, but I'm going to list the five that we did look at in our final study here. So the first one is typing. It's a very simple text to sentence out. There's a swiping task where we ask people to swipe a numeric grid, uh, pass, passcode on a three by three grid. Uh, we have an application where we're measuring the heart rate of a person because there's literature that suggests that the heart rate variability will increase as someone's consumed alcohol. And what we noticed as we developed this test was that you have to hold the phone really still if you're gonna measure the heart rate through the smartphone using PPG if you're familiar with the technique. So we also use that as an opportunity to measure how coordinated a person can be by holding the phone really still. We also look at a, a simple reaction task where someone re, uh, responds to a visual stimulus. And we also do a choice reaction task where people respond to multiple stimuli. I don't have enough time to talk about all of them, so I'm going to go into at least a little bit of detail about these two that I've highlighted here, the typing task and the simple reaction task. So the typing task, as I mentioned before, we're asking them to type sentences. We aren't asking them to just randomly text because it's hard to know what the ground truth is in some case. So, uh, so we're using the, uh, as a ground truth, we're using sentences that are developed from Mackenzie Sukareff, their, um, their set of sentences. And we're inspired to do this test from many different cases in literature that have looked at um, how alcohol will affect fine grain motor control. So for example, the Purdue pegboard test is a simple test where people will take uh, very small pins, move them out from one hole and put them into another. And the features that we're using are also borrowed from literature. We're really not trying to reinvent the wheel. We're trying to take advantage of all the awesome work that other people have done. So for example, as a, a measure of a performance, what we do is we leverage uh, calculations that have been uh, proposed by Sugareff and McKenzie. So for example, if you're ever interested in text entry, what you often find is that people will categorize keystrokes into one of four categories a correct keystroke, so you typed in the next character that was supposed to be typed, an incorrect keystroke that was later fixed, an incorrect keystroke that was not fixed, and then a fix itself. So for example, a delete keystroke. So then you could come up with many interesting ratios and combinations of these numbers, which could be interpreted in different ways. So for example, you can have something called utilized bandwidth, which is saying out of all the keystrokes that were made, how many of those were actually correct? How many of them were actually efficient for the bandwidth of your typing? So that's an example of a performance metric. For an example of a sensor feature, what we could do is that we looked at research from Gola et al, who looked at how people type and how accelerometer data can measure how their typing may be impaired from walking, for example. So if we were to look at acceleration or force that's exerted on the phone over time, as someone's typing, say, the word Earth here, we might see five impulses as the person strikes the screen at different times. So we can measure things like acceleration data, gyroscope data, before, after, during these keystrokes. You can imagine, for example, a hypothesis could be made that as a person's more drunk, maybe they hit the keys harder, maybe they tilt the phone more, things like that. The simple reaction task that we use is based on a, I always forget the acronym, psychomotor vigilance task. There we go. Um, the task, we have a big shiny red square. When it turns green, we ask the person to touch it with their finger, thumb, whichever digit they prefer. And then once it turns red, it goes off. And there's been a lot of literature that's looked at this particular task, uh, both for measuring fatigue and alcohol. Um, there's also a lot of literature that's looked at alcohol and just plain old reaction, press a button tasks. 
Uh, for an example of a performance-based metric, we can look at simply reaction time, so how, how quickly did they react to the finger down, the finger up event. And for the sensor data, we can look at how steadily they held the phone. Again, did they move the screen more, possibly they, when they were drunk and things like that. So in our uh, user study, what we did was that we implemented a whole bunch of these tasks in sequence. So someone would go through a typing task, then they would do a swiping task, then they would do the balance heart rate task, and they would repeat it five times. And then we did a simple reaction task five times, and then we did a choice reaction task five times. So a lot of tasks, overall, it maybe takes five minutes uh, towards the beginning, maybe even eight minutes towards the end. We would not imagine this being the final app that, you know, if it were to be deployed, we aren't saying that everyone would need to do these tasks five times. This is more just so we can collect data and see how repeatable certain things are. So we built up a whole bunch of different features looking at these performance metrics and sensor data. So we used a random forest regression, ideally to separate some of the uh, correlation between di uh, different features that we don't, don't want to be correlated. We looked at both the mean of the different features across different trials and also the standard deviation. So you can imagine maybe for some person as they're reacting to the, the green and red square, maybe the reaction time doesn't really change, but the spread across multiple trials changes. And that's an interesting feature that we can capture. And then any time-based features we had were log transformed so that they could be comparable to everything else. Okay, so let's go to the fun part. How do we, how do, we do this study and how do we get the IRB to approve it? So luckily, it's really easy when you can find that someone's done this in the past. Um, I'll, I'll get into later about other alternatives we could have done to the study and the pros and cons of that. But we found a study that was done by a psychologist named Shaheen Hashtrudi in 1984, and it worked with a breathalyzer and just giving them alcohol to drink. So what we did was that we estimated the amount of alcohol it took to get someone to a certain blood alcohol level using one of those online calculators you can find, for example. So height, weight, amount that you're drinking, how long between. And then we got permission to give each participant one shot of 80 proof vodka every 10 minutes. Again, it sounds like a lot, it is kind of a lot, but we got approval for it. <laughs> and yes, it had to be vodka, we had to specify exactly what kind. Uh, so we repeated this every 10 minutes, and then we used a breathalyzer to make sure we we're on the right track because there's a lot of different factors. It's not as simple as just stick into a calculator and figure it out. People may have had more water one day than another. Maybe tolerance is different. They ate more food. It's a very messy procedure, to be honest, but we got good at it after a while. Uh, we repeated until we knew we were at the right ballpark of 0.03%. And then we waited 15 minutes for them to ideally plateau off because doing measurements while we're giving alcohol can obviously be very noisy. And as I mentioned, we waited until we got to the target. And then once they got to the target, they would do the test. Something I want to point out is that, that convincing the getting people to drink alcohol was actually easy. But the inclusion exclusion criteria was very messy. So um, it being in the United States, the drinking age is 21. So all of our participants had to be over 21, which was fine. Uh, we had to ask that uh, we cannot have participants who had a history of alcoholism and that we're able to do through self-report. Uh, same thing with medication that could have had some um, bad effects with alcohol. We weren't allowed to have participants leave until they're at 0.04, so that took some time um, of hanging out with me. And then the, the scary one, and I can go into more detail about this, but we had a long back and forth with the IRB, is that they required us to distribute pregnancy tests to female participants who want to participate in our study. The very quick summary is that they said, are you going to give alcohol to pregnant women? We said, okay, no, there's literature that says that we shouldn't. And they said, how are you going to know? And we said, self-report. And then they said, how are they going to know? And we said, I don't know. And then they point us to this website from this organization, and there's a federal recommendation, strong recommendation, that we distribute pregnancy tests. I could go, I could have a long conversation afterwards about all the back and forth and all the ethical issues that we had with this, but that was a lost fight in the end. So nevertheless, we we're excited that we got, eventually got IRB approval, so we said, okay, let's go do this study. So we got participants who were willing to get into a room with me at eight o'clock. And then we followed the procedure until they got to the legal limit in the United States, which is 0.08. And then they used the app every 20 minutes. They're stuck in the room, might as well get a whole bunch of data from them, right? 
So we did this with five people who were very brave, and it ended up being a very big mess, not because of the procedure, but because of the data that ended up coming out of it. So the issue, we're going to use some imaginary axes here. So on, you're going to see on the bottom, we're going to be varying both time and hypothetical blood alcohol level, if you will. So they came into my, uh, to our office sober at the very beginning. And as they're drinking over time, their blood alcohol would increase, and it's getting later into the night, 930. And then we couldn't really let them leave until they got to 0.04, so I'm shoving cookies in their mouths, and I'm saying, get sober quicker. And eventually we get to 0.04, and it's 11.45, and then they leave. And I'm happy because we get data. But then we look at this hypothetical effect on performance that happens. And what we kind of uncovered is that, particularly with these performance-based features, as the, time was increase, as the time was increasing, they were learning how to use that better. But then they were also getting tired because they're sick of being in a room with me. And then there was this hypothetical effect of alcohol where they, as they get drunker, they would be getting worse. But then as they're getting sober, they're getting better. So there's all these different effects that are on the same data. And we had to untangle that somehow. So instead, we did a multi-day study, which was even funner to recruit for. <laughs> so each day was assigned a, blood, a different blood alcohol level. We did increasing amounts for everyone for the sake of safety. If someone couldn't handle a 0.04, we shouldn't make them go any higher. We started at 5 p.m. each day because just of the amount of time it took. They used the app while sober at the beginning as a baseline, and then we had them get to the prescribed level at the very end. And this allowed us to do some really interesting things with the data. So we eventually came to the conclusion that we would need some sort of user-specific calibration. One way we could do that is that if we have our performance metric that we want to use as a baseline, for example, we could take the sober condition first uh, at the first day, the first time they used the app, and then just look at all the times they used the app while they were drunk towards the end, and then use that single baseline and use the delta of the feature as our feature rather than the actual number itself. When we hypothesize that there was a learning curve that was affecting it, maybe they, they were getting used to our keyboard, for example, what we could do is we could take the sober baseline at the beginning of each day, fit it to a learning curve, look at the drunk condition, which from that data doesn't look like it has a clear trend, but we could see that the delta from the learning curve for those drunk conditions has a trend. So there's a lot of evaluation that we have in the paper, and of course I can't go over all of it, but I'll talk about some of the highlights. So what kind of user-specific calibration did we need? Could we get away with the single baseline? Do we have to do the curve? Spoiler alert, it's the latter. Um, did increasing the number of trials actually improve our results, or were, could we get away with using just a single trial? And does combining the tasks improve our performance? So we were able to get 14 participants. Most of them were young, between the ages 21 and 35. And as I mentioned, recruitment was kind of difficult because of the long-term nature of the study and the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Uh, so here's some numbers to show how the different uh, calibration methods would compare against themselves. So the learning curve ended up having better results. We got a very high Pearson correlation score of 0.96. And you can see the absolute mean error as a point of comparison of uh, the breathalyzer we used, which was $100, so not super expensive, but also not the dirt cheap model, um, had a reported accuracy of 0.05%. When we varied the number of trials, we actually found for a single task, we found that it didn't really have a significant effect on our results. There's a big table in the paper with almost all the combinations possible. And we found that the choice reaction task in particular actually did pretty well on its own. So there's something about not just reacting to a single stimulus, but having to balance one of four uh, squares. So it's kind of like whack-a-mole, if you're familiar with that game. Something about the nature of having the extra thought challenged people. And then if we look at all tasks and all trials, just say how well could we do if we had all of the data at our disposal? Here's a correlation plot showing the ground truth, the breathalyzer blood alcohol level at the bottom, and the predicted blood alcohol level at the top. The red dots correspond to being sober, using the definition of 0.04 as our sober limit, and then the green dots for the being drunk, if you will, or above that level. If you were to generate a classifier off of this, we achieved a sensitivity of 93.9%, and a specificity of 82.3%. So these numbers will sound very high, but I want to stress that these um, require very, uh, very rigorous user-specific calibration. So coming up with ways of addressing that in the future is something that we're looking into. The study was conducted in a quiet office space, so we didn't have the distractions that you would expect in a bar, so how would that affect the results? 
And then breathalyzers aren't the best me me method of measuring ground truth blood alcohol content. You could We could have done the study in a clinic where you stick a needle and then deliver alcohol intravenously. The uh, concern we had is that people may not behave naturally if they were in that kind of situation. So you may get worse features, worse, worse data that you're operating on, but a better ground truth. So we, we had a back and forth about whether that would be the best solution. Uh, I'm out of time, so I'll conclude and say thank you. right at the time limit so if there's anyone that has a question <laughs> ask all right hi diane watson university of waterloo so <clears throat> you talked about uh detecting blood alcohol content or like or like side effects rather yes. um in the case that like a bar would cut you off or mm -hmm car doesn't let you drive. Um, did you ever consider designing for uh, handing it to your friend and asking your friend to fill out the test for you? So the, the, the use cases I described were things that we thought of. We never mm -hmm. actually deployed them for right. that. I think it would be interesting to see whether friends would help, like help the person cheat the system or help them like it, it'd be interesting to see how they would play into it because I can imagine a situation where maybe the friend's drunk and then they hold the phone for them and all of a sudden they're gonna like in the car application that's gonna help them get into their car and that's a very bad situation or you can imagine the other one where the friend is giving it and say hey you really need to stop prove to me you're sober and then the friend is kind of being that backstop to help them out so we haven't really thought about but I think it could go it could go either way in terms of whether that would be the right thing to do if that's All right, clear. thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Yadian Zhuang from Andover University of Technology. Mm -hmm. Thanks for your talk. Uh, I just uh, curious about: Do you find any difference between the heavy user and light users? Uh, in what way? In terms of in terms of the amount of alcohol we gave them, or like in terms of their behavior? Because uh, we we didn't we didn't like separate out the data and compare the two that way. Yeah, my original question is about maybe some participants, they are very good at you drinking alcohol, for example. Sure. I can only drink maybe one cup or two cups. Sure. So, so one thing I should point out is that we did this user-specific calibration to get the comparison relative to your own baseline, but in the end what we did was a global model. So. And that's kind of where the random forest comes into play. It's that you might be really good at, at texting after you've had a whole bunch of alcohol. Maybe I'm really bad at texting. And then maybe you're really bad at, re at reacting to the stimulus, whereas I'm really good at it. And the idea of a random forest is that you have all these sub decisions that can be made. And maybe you'll fire off as drunk for one tree and then maybe not for the other and vice versa. So the random forest kind of helps in that regard. Yeah, all right. Um, let's thank all of our great speakers and all their great talks today. Um,